And welcome everybody to TNM Coaching Unplugged and Zoran Todorovic Interconnected Podcast. Welcome, welcome back. I'm so happy you're coming every week. We have such a lovely comments and reviews from you guys. Every time we post something, we get this surge of love and light and joy back from you. And I just want to take the moment to be grateful for all of you who are continuously listening to our podcast and getting inspired by our guests. And today... It's a special one. You know, usually, you know, we bring people from the personal development industry and we kind of always position our podcast as something that is going to elevate your mind, elevate your heart, elevate your soul by giving you the tools, skills, knowledge, and insights when it comes to how can you become the best possible version of themselves. And why is today so special is because we have an artist and um, we were talking about this in last podcast with another artist, how important it is to elevate our soul and how it is important to really get in relationship with our soul to to connect to who we truly are on the level of the essence and that that connection it's further facilitating our interconnection with everything and one of the most important point of interconnection in our life it's our connection to nature and you know we know how significant nature is today and how that nourishing that relationship with the nature that we sometimes call mother earth uh, our divine mother, our goddess mother, all the plants and animals and minerals and all the kingdoms within this nature is so important right now for us to get in relationship with. Somehow in our Western world, we forgot about that. We got too consumed with the consumer society. We live in the cities. We disconnect from the nature. And as a result of that disconnection, we suffer. You know, I've seen a lot of people who come to coaching with me the, the root of this suffering is this lack of connection with, with nature, with themselves to start with and with nature as well. So when I came across Oliver, you know, I was, first of all, really impressed by his presence. There was something about him that was calming and present and real. And whenever you have somebody like that who is calm, present and real, for me, I always am so curious, what is he connecting to? You know, how is he managing to maintain this presence and calmness? and him being real in this world. And then, of course, I discovered his uh, work and, and artistry. And I was like, wow, now I get it. He's getting more and more and more into connection to himself. And then he's really, really connecting to the nature. Uh, and then he's featuring and expressing and, and showing us what this connection can really be. So what I decided to do today, it's a little bit different because I usually introduce our guests. And uh, I was talking to Oliver and I was saying, like, why don't you introduce yourself? So. Oliver, back to you. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and then we dive into this exciting conversation of Elevation today? Hello, Zoran. Thank you so much. Such a lovely introduction. My name is Oliver Barnett and I, I grew up in the UK, but it wasn't until around my early 20s that I moved to South Africa. So I think there was, I grew up in quite a traditional background that was... Um, it was more used to the kind of manicured nature, the manicured garden. So my mother, who was very interested in gardening, she would, she would prepare these beds over long periods of time and waiting for the spring where they would suddenly sort of burst into form. So this was my, my kind of understanding of nature, that it was something that was, that was essentially guided by the hand of man, which, which although completely beautiful, uh, prepared me for an enormous change when I moved to Cape Town, where I, where I, um, where I was very struck by the, what I would call the self-regulating intelligence of nature and the wildness. So this was, this was a calling that I think lay somewhere deeper within me that wanted to connect to this, this wild feeling in myself. Mm -hmm. having, having lived a, what I would say was a, a fairly typical, you know, boarding school, this kind of sort of existence where, where I had everything very firmly ordered for me. Suddenly I had a new playground to kind of experience myself in a, in a very, very different light. So, so moving to Cape Town um, in, in the sort of mid 2000s was like a kind of, you know, I, I think we sort of talk about those sort of kernels that sort of open one's awareness. And, and I spent, you know, I became quite obsessed by spending as much time as I could in what I would call wild places or sort of craggy outcrops. And this happened to coincide with um, 
a shift in my perception around food and and kind of personal health so i was i was discovering things that would optimize my health and eating very well and so, suddenly feeling like i had a ton more energy so i was able to kind of walk a lot further carry more things and so this was this was a process i would say that over between 2007 and 2010 i was really just just experiencing a very very different connection to the natural world than the one i'd i'd grown up with and um but it but it wasn't until a few years later that i decided that i needed to document this somehow you know whether it was through, whether it was through the written word or whether it was through a, a form of visual art was was unclear because i hadn't really used a camera up until that point and um so and and it happened to coincide with you know photographers would laugh at me here because i actually started to learn to take photographs with my first iphone okay <laughs> it was just it was something that was very handy and it was, had yeah. a lot of i was into all the kind of application and anyway so so i would take this this new tool with me to all these different places and I think what I what I did quite early on, which which is something which symbolizes how I operate when I go on long walks, is that I that I take note of what I would call power spots, places with a particular kind of energetic pulse. Mm -hmm. They there are many around Table Mountain that I go to. I have I have a kind of internal map of places that I go and sit quietly and actually kind of tune into mm -hmm. tune into this ancient vibration of the mountain. So. So with this kind of this this growing internal map, and then taking my my phone and um, photographing things that initially were just things that caught my eye, whether they were beautiful things or a pattern on a on a piece of bark, or just just showing a lot of interest in visually documenting what I felt impactful from these walks, and then over time, this this became a kind of thing that I would do as a ritual. You know, I right. would, I would, I would go on long walks, mm -hmm. and I would find particular places that almost sort of it was almost like kind of creating shrines in the forest. You know, a form of sort of land art. You know, I'd, I'd find these places, and I would spend a bit of time there, and I would take, I would photograph them, and then I would kind of constantly revisit these places in a way of familiarizing myself mm -hmm. um, with the energetic pulse of the place. So the more I did this. And this happened to coincide with the time where I was also starting to learn how to alter my consciousness in a way that was meditative, or at least not bring all my kind of world, my 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 you know day to day stuff with me on nature walks, because that was that was initially I'm just someone with a very busy head going on walks in order to kind of like clear the decks, uh -huh. mm -hmm. which I think is what people. A lot of people do when they go on walks is just a kind of it's a way of sort of grounding centering and so once once i've kind of learned to not be constantly in the sort of thought cycle uh, visiting these places started to take on an entirely new dimension because rather than me creating a kind of imprint of what i wanted to find or what i wanted to see or document i found that these um there was a kind of reciprocal energetic exchange with these places that was that was more about what they were telling me um mm -hmm. so it was it was more a case of i mean i don't i don't ever believe we can kind of still our mind to absolutely nothing without going to sit in a, on a mountain or a cave i'm not i'm not sure that's really practical for the kind of life most of us live but um i was able to and am able to reach a kind of what i would call a kind of nexus point where there's enough quiet for there to be this inversion where suddenly information from nature is coming into you rather than you imprinting your own um, your own kind of uh, polemic onto the scene. And, and as a result of this, more interesting imagery started to emerge, in my opinion, and I started to print a few pictures here and there. There were, there were some interesting there are many lakes at the top of Table Mountain. Not not everyone knows this. They're, they're reservoirs that hold water, and they where where the where the water meets the land are often these these um, these incredible rock reflections, mm -hmm. a, a very sort of totemic. And there, there was something in there that I was or that I'm still drawn to this day. Whereas 
it reminded me of when I was in the Amazon and you kind of, when you're, when you're on a boat floating down the Amazon and, and the water is very still, you can actually just tilt your head and, and suddenly the, the mirroring effect of the forest on the water kind of opens up. It's like a portal, you know, you suddenly kind of yeah. see for some reason the bilateral symmetry of, of reflected nature provides this incredibly totemic or uh, sort of shrine-like um, effect. So mm -hmm. I, and I stumbled upon this particular um, effect while I was playing around with my phone on, and kind of apps and various things. And, and the very first picture I took with using this technique turned what was quite a, and not a particularly um, interesting tree stump into what looked like a Celtic cross. You know, it had, a, it had something very, very symbolic, um, something almost that I felt, because I, I spent a lot of time in Scotland when I was younger and I, it was, it was, I remember I just, I had to kind of take a moment when I saw this symbol emerge, it was very, it was quite powerful. So my, my question then was, how is splitting nature in half on a bilateral axis suddenly showing me symbols and there were Buddhas, there were, there were kind of Christ, there were all, and all sorts of different, different sort of structures appearing down the, down the symmetry line. And it occurred to me that this was perhaps some kind of a portal into, into a much older um, relationship with nature that um, ancestrally we've, we've always had this incredible, you know, this, this much deeper connection that our, that our modern lives have, have set us free from. And I felt like I was through this process somehow getting in touch with, getting in touch with the, with the soul of the landscape. And that really developed from taking these images from the phone into something that I then bought a proper camera and started to be able to get higher resolution so that I was able to essentially the, mo the more spirits started to appear, the higher the resolution, because you were able to kind of focus in on these tiny little details. And, and that became, I mean, it became a mild obsession for a few years, just su suddenly discovering something that was that I felt like I was in a, I was in a, a relationship here that wasn't just about me making something and showing people. It was about kind of showing up in a place that, that was, that moved me. And that was, and that, um, and, and a places that have actually shared energetically shared quite a lot of information with me over the years. Um, the, well, there's one notable one, which I think your, your listeners would be interested in, which is, I had um there was a particular walk I went on a few years ago where I was sitting quietly on, at the base of a of a tree stump in this beautiful little glade right on top of the mountain that not many people know it so it doesn't get much foot traffic and I kind of quietened quietened myself which is what I do every time I go on you know I find a place I sit quietly for a while before getting any technology out I just I sit there and I and I I merge with the place to some level. There's a moment where you can almost feel this kind of cellular, like you're kind of, you actually be kind of, you're becoming part of the place. And I heard this, um, I heard this voice. It was, it wasn't a human voice and it was, but it was discernible as, as being a voice that was representing the place. And it said to me, you know, we, you know, humans, humans live in a lot of fear uh, around, around the development of AI or, or what, I, what I thought it was referring to as artificial intelligence or, and that the nature spirits hold the same fear towards humans as we hold towards AI, you know, and, and actually by, by meeting people like myself or other people who show up in nature in order to just be present and love and reflect that we we can actually embrace we can embrace this that this allows us to address this fear by knowing that there's people like you doing this work and that was really wow. it was quite a it was quite a powerful moment for me to sort of say okay so there's whether or not this is a kind of figment or hallucinatory machination of because I because I don't always understand what what's communicating with me or if there's a particular entity in the space that day or if there are, um, but it was quite clear that that was that was um, a real blessing for this work and I've I've as a result been very dedicated to it um, since then. 
So literally the nature spoke to you and you've heard it. I mean, we can intellectualize it, of course, and you can say, I don't yeah. understand how that happened. But the bottom line is that you heard the voice, the nature spoke to you and you understood the yeah. message. Yeah, I did. It was, it was a, she just, it was also just through, through, through quiet, the, the kind of revelation was it was, it was purely just by coming, becoming quiet. It wasn't by taking something and going to those realms, which, which I've, mm -hmm. which I've obviously explored. And, um, and for me, for me, that was a kind of, I mean, I think the, the, the plant worlds have the ability to take us to all sorts of different areas of the cosmos, some of which are, difficult for us to integrate but when you're actually kind of hearing and and experiencing communication through just an absolute clarity of mind for me that has that has more potency mm -hmm. um uh, or it, at least it's at least it's easier to integrate because it also kind of makes me question why would i give this brain or this mind extra things to to kind of explore these worlds when it's when it's ready readily available just by closing my eyes and and breathing deeply for a few minutes <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> what I'm curious about is that you mentioned that the only thing you need to do is it's be still and silent and quiet. Is that the only thing that you do in order to interconnect? With um, I, I do. I do a breath cycle. The, the the breath is the one thing that gets me into my body because I've. I mean, I think a lot of us have lived quite disembodied childhoods, and you know, I, I was very. I wasn't an academic, but I was someone who was very um, cerebral and just constantly living in my head. So, so this kind of this wake up call one day of like, you do actually have a body to live in as well. <laughs> when, I was, when I was in my 20s. So, and that's that's an ongoing project, to be honest, because, you know, the, my mind does still um, it is a little bit like a wild horse sometimes. But yeah. es essentially, I do I do a series of, of pranayama breath cycles. Mm -hmm. And um, I usually distribute a little bit of tobacco or other what, whatever I have in the forest just to kind of lay, lay a, a kind of um, foundation, a little offering. Mm -hmm. And then I sit, I sit quietly and usually with my back against a tree and I kind of envisage energy flowing through me and through the tree. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a kind of, um, I guess it's like a Zen um, it's a technique which someone taught me years ago of just kind of imagining the, the energy spiral coming through me out the top of my head and up through the tree and down through the roots and back through me again. So it's like a kind of cyclical energy exchange uh, mm -hmm. as well as a little bit of, of toning. Cause I have a, I have a voice that's got good, a good tone. And um, I've, I've had an experience many times with my voice where the, you know, one's own voice is is a, essentially a representation of the you know the original vibration, um, yeah. and I, so so a combination of those three things usually would be my way of of trying to tune in. Yeah, yeah, and it's a beautiful what you're describing right now because you know being in the presence of the nature, the stillness and silence, and really reaching out uh, and yeah. connecting, and it really enriches the soul because no matter how we rationalize it later on with our cognitive abilities we feel that connection and yeah. i'm also you know super curious about that relationship when you said instead of me superposing my thoughts my beliefs my processes onto the nature i'm there listening and then the nature is communicating back to me so you're opening to really receive and to be present enough in the moment to to receive that communication back so it's like nature is reaching out to you and asking you to, to listen, right? Yeah. So how is it then translating into the photography? So when the nature reaches out to you and says, hey, you know, here I am, listen to me, or, you, or point your attention in that direction, see this, how, what happens next in your creative process? So uh, there's, there's usually a point where, where one, when one has become, um, when one has become, what I would call still or, or connected to the place, I will then um, I will then walk around this particular area with my shoes off, um, and essentially looking for. I guess you know it's the the closest I would, the closest I would, reference what I do is to have an imaginary net like a kind of but like someone who kind of collects butterflies or. Mm -hmm. But I don't actually have a net in my hand. I'm just, I'm kind of essentially kind of 
collecting perhaps um, little. It's how one thing that I've always one thing I've always said is when when I when I start making an artwork, it it never starts from when I've taken the picture and I put it into my computer and start playing with it starts from the very beginning of a walk you know you're kind of you have this kind of imaginary net that is that is circling around you and and I feel like it kind of guides my attention towards particular colors or particular patterns or a texture and so my my next approach would then be to to compose or or you know gather images of this particular texture whether it's a piece of bark or whether it's a colorful mm -hmm. it's the way that the curl of a petal or or, mm -hmm. or the back of an insect or something and and so i in that way i can't, i'm kind of gathering i'm gathering this material as if i was a forager you know mm -hmm. I, I've, I've often said, i've often used this term foraging photons when i about my photography because i'm kind of i'm kind of collecting things and i still haven't formed an image of what's going to come from that even mm -hmm. though some patterns have, you know, you have a tendency to kind of go, oh, that looks like a kind of, that looks like the, the ear of an owl or something, you know, mm -hmm. the pattern. Um, and therefore the mind suddenly wants, oh, let's make an owl out of a tree stump. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, I guess in the early days, it was, it was, it was a bit more literal with what would, what would emerge. Mm -hmm. um, but, but initially, so, so, so I spend time gathering little, usually macro images of macro photography is when, you, when you're able to go collect the small world and kind of enlarge it. So, and I have a particular acuity for macro photography. I discovered this when I bought my first camera um, as opposed to landscape or other kinds of photography. So I collect various different bits of information or usually quite what I would call quite seasonal things. So, so whether it's a mushroom that happens to just emerge at that time of year in this place or, or a piece of lichen that's, that's just been refreshed by, by recent rain or something like that, that has the different. And, and I, I then kind of have a, I have a huge database of all this different raw material that at some, that at some juncture I will then sit with and I will, I will gather and I will, I will kind of coordinate this imagery based on what I feel, you know, complementary colors and very sort of perhaps more kind of artistic um, uh, leanings, but, mm -hmm. but always with a view to playing with the imagery until something emerges that somehow represents the exchange. Um, yeah. and, and, and often there are kind of animal totems and other images that, um, that come from the images based, based on its predominantly bilateral shaping and um, you often get the kind of you often will find you have you suddenly have the kind of eye socket of a lizard but from um you know from a leaf skeleton or something like that or it it, it never it, it's never an exact thing but it's a that's what makes it so beautiful in some ways for me to do because i don't i genuinely don't know what's going to come out of the session do you observe it in a way and then this image pops up or do you recognize it or does it find you? Because I've seen some of the images and, you know, yeah. participants or listeners will go at the end of this call towards your Instagram and they're going to see the beauty that I see. Mm. So the first time when I was looking into it, I was like, wow, look at that. Look at that being inside of that. Yeah inside of that image you know who is that being <laughs> now, how come this being is in there <laughs> to me it's a light that's what i'm asking do, do, do you see it yourself or it just pops up and shows itself or how does it well i think i think the the the, um, the animation of of nature in in this way is exactly what i'm trying to achieve you know you you the how I kind of say whether an image is finished or not is whether it, it has its own life. You know, does, does this image have its own life force? If the answer is yes, the chances are that it's, that it's no. complete. Or, no. um, there are many things that I've seen that I, haven't, that I haven't felt coming through the imagery before, and there are many things I haven't seen that do, do seem to come through the imagery. Um, I've had quite a number of people tell me that they've seen one or two of the entities that emerge from these pictures before in their in their own journey. Mm -hmm. um, so 
again, I don't like the the one challenge I have when I'm when I'm on these in these spaces is that I get I can get kind of overwhelmed by the possibilities. You know, there's 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 so there's so much richness in in the potential of what I'm doing that I have to keep kind of learning to humble myself and realize that you can't. You know, I've I've got this perhaps inflated sense that you can create an image that kind of contains, you know, a larger part of the mystery that, than than perhaps is possible. Um, but so as a, to to counteract that, I've I've decided just to continue to make lots of images that then then the work can be kind of viewed as a collection, uh, and and therefore you're with each image you're just it's like a um, I think it's a William Bake. Blake phrase where he uses pinpricks of the eternal. You know, every every little image is just like it's just a little prick onto the onto the continuum of what of what is possible with um with kind of my own artistic endeavors. And I like that because it, it doesn't it kind of alleviates this need to kind of for grandiosity or anything that is that comes through the work that is um that is you know perhaps pushing or striving for more than what it really is. And I, I love what you're saying there because, you know, pushing to become something that is not and seeking for that grandiosity sometimes is absolutely unnecessary because what we're seeing, it's already magical. It's already present. It's already there. And the nature has this ability to teach us that, to remind us, you know, don't look any further. You don't need to go anywhere. You just need to be here right now in this moment and witness and see and experience. Yeah. Do you feel that your work is inspiring people to get back into this more profound relationship with the nature. You know, I'm listening, you know, like these days, I'm just going to elaborate a bit more and give you the, the floor back again. I'm listening to the, these days throughout uh, different interviews and podcasts and conversations. You know, people are worried about climate. People are buying into the whole uh, globe of climate change and, you know, how we are such a destructive force, you know, as humans yeah. in relationship to nature. And people, people experience a lot of guilt, guilt, especially the younger generations. I'm listening to the younger people and they're like, we are destroying, we are belittling, we are diminishing, we are such a destructive force. And, and for me, I'm always struggling with that because on one hand, I see that we have a lot to do with that. But on the other hand, you know, if you were just to get back into that relationship that you are talking about and be in that you know, synthesis and, and the coherent field with nature, you know, our natural ability to be in relationship will emerge. Yeah? Because I never met anybody in my life who, who says, I hate nature. You know, I always, whenever I talk to people, they always say, well, I love nature. I love being in the mountains. I love being in the creeks. I love being in the forest. I love laying in the fields and, and the grasses. Nobody said, oh, you know what, I really, really hate nature. People might be uncomfortable in nature because they haven't been for a long time, but they don't hate it. Yet along, we have this relationship that is now specifically portrayed in the media as we are the you know, bad guys. So what would you say to that? And, and how do you feel your work, especially you being there, witnessing, highlighting, showing, representing, creating the the paintings and the images and illustrations, it's supporting us to get back into that constructive, beautiful relationship that we need to have. Well, there's a, there's a lot to say on this um, topic, as you know, because um, we've, we've kind of ushered ourselves into a culture that, um, that essentially wants to turn uh, our relationship with nature into a movie. You know, we've got, we've got, we've got X amount of time before so and so is going to be um, destroyed, or you know, th this is going to be a kind of we're coming to a climax now where things are going to kind of like irreparably break down. Mm -hmm. And my experience of of time in nature is very different to that because when one is in touch with um, when one is in touch with what I call the non-human world, you know, the world of spirits and gods and entities and it doesn't take long before you realize that that world is very, very alive and well. And, and that, that world is, it's, it's a lot older and more established than our, than our own culture. And to me, it's kind of the height of grandiosity to sort of say that, you know, we've got X amount of time left before it's all tickets, you know, 
I mean, I do have the great luxury of being able to climb up the mountain and go to very quiet places where perhaps tuning into those energies is, is easier and um, more available to me than people living in cities or, but at the same time, I'm, I'm coming really at uh, what I do from a mythic perspective. And, and in terms of when, when we're able to become storytellers or myth tellers, we, we realize that our culture has always been on the sort of on, on the brink of peril to some degree. You know, we, we, <laughs> always. We're kind of, we've, we come from, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of born of people who, you know, were, were kind of like fighting for, um, you know, fighting barbarically for the kind of control of the Northern hemisphere or certain aspects of the kind of sort of yeah. Viking territories. So, so in, within my, my blood and my bones is, is the, is the, is the kind of the distant memory of combat, perhaps more than peace and coexistence. If, if, if I'm honest, I mean, that's, that doesn't almost feel like a kind of, default setting but we, we are fortunate in this world to actually have the ability to operate differently and I think one one thing that the, the lockdown really emphasized to people was to, it allowed them to look at their very own connection to to nature whether it was spending more time outside or mm. and suddenly this the message became from my experience less about Greta Thunberg and David Attenborough sort of, you know, shaking his hand and saying, we, we've got this and that emaciated polar bears and this kind of thing. It actually came, came more into, you know, what is, what is my own imprint on this beautiful sphere or this beautiful piece of land that I call home? What, what, is, what is my own uh, imprint? And once you change your kind of, perhaps stop reading so much news or all these kind of, um, you know, there's a certain amount of propaganda in the space, I, I believe, that is that are guiding certain economic incentives, and that's not really my field of expertise. But at the same time, what is your own connection to the elements? And I'm seeing so much growth and so many uh, new ways of looking at things. I'm seeing people really kind of coming, you know, whether whether or not um, my project inspired other people locally to find their own unique kind of imprint into how to conserve or how to preserve. Um, but I'm seeing more desire, more passion, more interest in, in kind of growing, even in sort of micro environments, a, a new earth. And I'm seeing it everywhere at the moment. Um, mm. So I'm, and I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're also experiencing this. Absolutely. I think the positive outlook is extremely important because this positive outlook that directs our attention and also our intention and the energy and our thoughts and then actions. So I think that, you know, once when you speak with somebody like you, you know, and myself with a little bit of different perspective to what's really going on, it's, it, it empowers people. Yeah. And I love what you said that when you tune into that nature around you, it's much older than we are. It's a well-established system. It, it functions in a most remarkable and beautiful way. And we are not the ones who can really destroy this at will. So I think that we need to re, reposition yeah. ourselves. And the reason why I was asking this question is because recently I was in a group of young people passionate about life, passionate about mm -hmm. nature, but they have this doom city mentality that everything is going to be destroyed unless we do something radical and i don't see it like that i think when we get into relationship with this and this is what you're describing in mean stillness and silence we find our spot in the nature we allow ourselves to open up to this interaction and communication yeah. then the whole relationship changes and also nature is teaching you like that voice that came to my mind to your mind at one point in time you know i'm so happy that you're here because yeah. we are also fearful, fearful of your impact you know this is so reassuring that you are present with us might happen, right? Yeah. Right. right. So, right. so, so while, um, I mean, if you put me with those, those, I mean, I can understand why the younger generation are, are um, you know, full of anger and full of um, all sorts of different uh, sort of negative uh, conditioning, because that's kind of, that's, that's all we're getting in this particular space. But my, my sense is to, um, by spending time in these old places, I kind of tune into that there's a wisdom that lives in the, the old version of me, you know, the, the version of me that that's been around from a lot longer than this body has been around. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very fortunate to be in touch with that, um, with that part of me. And, and so once you get that perspective of quite how, how long the earth has been doing its thing, how many times it's kind of spat out different life forms and then re reconfigured itself. Mm. I feel like um, 
you know, life, life is a, is a wild ride and, um, and we don't need to kind of like, kind of, there's, there's so much volume that comes with the story that a lot of which is if it, if it actually, if there wasn't so much volume around these issues, there's a chance that some of it would stop. Um, I'm not saying it's not happening. You know, there are irreversible things happening around the world. There are, there are economic um, powers at play that are, yeah. that are destroying resources. You know, that's, that's a fact. But, um, but I'm, I, I kind of, yeah, I don't, I don't like this idea of walking out of the movie 15 minutes early. You know, it's kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's quite it's quite um it's quite rude to the gods to kind of suggest that you know it's all it's all about to go kind of like um yeah, you know, it's all about, yeah. It's, it's yeah I, I, absolutely i was at uh, you know a uh, little gathering a few days ago with kogi tribes and uh, do you know who kogis are from like yes yeah, yeah. so you know i was listening to this kogi mama attentively and then he said you know there's a different ways of how we relate to nature and, and and one of the ways how we relate to nature we understand that we are one of nature and we are in deep relationship with nature we don't ask anything of nature actually we offer back to nature we nourish we guide nature we are we are loving the nature so we're living alongside with nature we're not living off nature and then he was explaining that how somehow you know us as the younger brothers and sisters because they perceive us perceive us western world as, as immature and young and he said beautifully somehow you get into this relationship and you need to live off it you know you, you always demand something from it but you're not really giving anything back and i was so touched when you said that when you sit down in a, a stillness and silence that you offer tobacco you, you create offering which is something that Kogis do really, really well. They, they honor, you know, the earth, they offer certain things before they start any relationship or any collaboration or asking anything in return. They're like giving more than they're receiving. So this is like, wow, this is the way, you know, for us to be with nature and not to live off nature like we live so far. Yeah. I also make um, one, of, one of the tuning in, um the the kind of i i make teas out of various different plants that i find on the mountains so we live in a very rich floral kingdom with lots of essential oils and lots of different smells and um huge amounts of daisies and different different kind of um a very very different floral biome to anywhere else in the world and one one amazing way to tune in is to is to make a tea i find i find that just like absolutely brings you brings you kind of into the moment so it's yes op offerings are important I and mean, I, I learned that quite quickly that i think someone actually once accused me of just like well, you know you're just taking things from nature and then let's putting them online and selling them and, you know i had a kind of argument with someone about this kind of <laughs> artistic merit of something so and and to a degree though you know there was a kind of aspect that perhaps triggered me in that regard but as a result i've kind of really upped my um I've upped the sort of what I would say my kind of my offerings and way, ways of actually kind of giving back to the earth before before taking from it. Yeah, yeah. So we can talk forever. We already, you know, far, far past our time. So what, where would you like to leave the audience with? I mean, when it comes to, you know, circling back to our conversation today and listening to you and, and uh, being with you, if you were to Tune into yourself right now and feel into what is the most important thing that you would love to share with the audience as a result of this conversation. Where would you love to leave them with? What is something that you feel it's important for all of us to tune in, to consider, to practice, to be with? What would you say? So there's a there's a particular um, there's a particular notion that I've been following now for the last ten years, which is that we're we're essentially as human beings living. Um, between two different depths. One I would call skin memory, which is kind of like who you are, your CV, you know, what you do day to day. Mm -hmm. uh, flesh, flesh memory, which is perhaps, you know, when, when you have, have an experience that, that suddenly remembers of something that happened earlier in your life and it moves you and you have a quiet moment. And then there's another dimension which, uh, which tribal, tribal people kind of are, are embroiled with, which I call bone memory. Now, bone memory is when something or someone 
says something or a sound or or you you see something that that takes you back to a place that you are sure was from before your time here on earth you know so, some some kind of a sort of some reverberation from what i would call the old world or the other world now i guess my 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 sense is and especially to people such as um you know those students you were you were talking to is is to th those are the stories that we need in our world at the moment the stories that are that are that are inciting memories of you know just older memories that kind of sit essentially in whether it's the akashic records or in our kind of in a, the collective consciousness mm -hmm. and they're available to us when we become quieter and spend more time with ourselves mm -hmm. um and we have more to offer people by uh, tuning into these kind of ideas rather than um, things that are purely happening in the human world. So my, my, my encouragement is, is really to spend more time with yourself in nature and, um, and to tune into perhaps the deeper levels of, of our awareness. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. More information on Oliver. It's on his Instagram, Oliver Barnett at Oliver Barnett, go there and see this wonderful imagery, photos, captations, they're just beautiful. I, you know, sometimes I just go and rest myself, uh, just with scrolling up and down because they communicate larger, louder than words. I mean, you will see for yourself. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Great Oliver, pleasure. Oliver, it was such a beautiful uh, experience to be with you in this space. And for the rest of the audience, enjoy this. I think this is a good summer listening. It's good to kind of now when you can get out of the houses, you know, into the nature, into the wilderness, be with that. Listen to this podcast, be with Oliver and inspire yourself to get in relationship with yourself on a deeper level, get in touch with your soul, get in touch with your nature. And thank you so much for tuning in, for listening. Lots of love to everybody. Until the next time, Oli, once again, thank you for coming. Thank you, Zoran. Thank <laughs> you.